Dit is de dertiende en uh, laatste livestream van dit jaar. En uh, ja, deze livestreams doen we in een, een serie van uh, elke maand om Nederlandse en buitenlandse kennis interactief bij elkaar te brengen. We hebben de ene keer Nederlandse spreker, de andere keer zelfs nu Engelse sprekers. En uh, ja, op die manier willen we eigenlijk met elkaar uh, heel veel leren. Voor meer informatie kan je onze agenda volgen. Die staat op logos.nl. En je kan ons ook volgen op YouTube, Facebook, Instagram en Twitter. En op die manier uh, kan je ook op de hoogte blijven. En de voorgaande livestreams zijn allemaal terug te vinden, ook op ons YouTube kanaal. Dus als je nou na deze livestream nog niet genoeg hebt gehad, dan kan je gewoon door naar de volgende. Wat is eigenlijk Logos Instituut? Hè? Want deze livestream wordt dus georganiseerd vanuit Logos Instituut. Nou, Logos Instituut heeft als missie om te helpen om heldere antwoorden te geven op grote vragen over Bijbel, geloof en wetenschap. En ja, daarvoor doen we eigenlijk allerlei dingen. We hebben een uitgebreide website, we geven ook lezingen. Uh, podcast en uh, nou, bijvoorbeeld zoals nu livestreams. En dat gaat over allerlei onderwerpen die dus te maken hebben met geloof en wetenschap. Denk aan geologie, astronomie, ethiek, paleontologie, onderwijs, apologetiek, biologie, archeologie enzovoort. Alles een beetje met een i. <laughs> en uh, nou, mocht u na deze livestream denken, zoiets zou ik ook wel willen, maar dan live. Bijvoorbeeld in uw kerk of op uw school of in een vereniging, dan kunt u ook op logos.nl uh, slash spreekbord uit mijn hoofd gezegd, kunt u ook spreekbeurten aanvragen. En daar ziet u ook een lijst met onderwerpen en met sprekers die uh, beschikbaar zijn. Nou, mijn naam is Erika de Stichter. Ik werk voor Logos Instituut en ik zal deze avond leiden. En bij mij vanavond is uh, Paul Garner. We hebben zojuist met hem een livestream gehad over zijn nieuwe boek, die... Uh, in, inmiddels ook vertaald is in het Nederlands, vorige week uitgekomen. En vanavond zal hij in deze livestream vertellen over de New Creationism. En omdat hij Engels spreekt, uh, zal ik dan ook switchen naar het Engels. En ja, het is mijn uh, wens, het is ons, onze wens en ons gebed dat het een uh, gezegende avond zal zijn. So I will switch to English now. Welcome Paul Garner, welcome back, I should say, because we just had another livestream with you about the book. Um, if you want to see this live stream uh, about the book, if you haven't seen it, you can see it later on our, on our channel. Uh, for now, we will be listening to Paul's presentation about the new creationism, building scientific theories on a biblical foundation. And um, it will be a presentation, but there will be also lots of space for questions. So. Um, take your notebook or whatever, write your questions down and um, you can put your questions on the Facebook chat or on the YouTube chat and we'll see it and, and, and uh, send them to Paul Garner in the Q&A session after uh, his presentation. So Paul, we're glad to hear what you have to say to us. Maybe you can start with briefly introducing yourself and then after that you can uh, go ahead and uh, do your presentation. And well, of course, we bless you. Uh, we we uh, hope God bless you in the presentation and all the listeners at home. Uh, so the word is uh, for you. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, and thank you to Logos Institute for inviting me uh, to, to give this talk today. And thank you for your warm introduction. And uh, we had a good time in the previous live stream as well, talking about uh, the, yeah. the new book, Fossils in the Flood. Um, yes, as Erica said, I'm I'm Paul Garner. Um, I have a, po a postgraduate degree in um, geoscience, specialising in paleobiology. Um, I work for a, an organisation here in Britain called Biblical Creation Trust. We're a small creationist organisation. I've worked for them for about 20 years now. And uh, I spend my time uh, doing some public speaking, uh, doing uh, some writing, and also doing uh, some creationist research, do doing scientific research. Um, so that's just a, a little bit about who I am. Um, and the topic for this evening is uh, my first book, The New Creationism. Uh, as you can see it there on, on, the, uh, on the slide. Um, as 
creationists, one of our goals is to construct an entirely different scientific story, a, a different scientific account that's consistent with both the biblical narrative and with the data of the physical world. Uh, as a creation scientist, that, that's what I'm interested in doing. And in order to do that, uh, I think it's not sufficient for us to simply try and poke holes in evolution or to tackle perceived scientific problems with our own ideas in a, a very disjointed or atomistic way. I, I think uh, what we have to do is to do the hard work of developing and testing our own scientific models, our own scientific explanations. And so in this talk uh, this evening, what I'd like to do is, is focus on some of the research that I, I think has contributed uh, to the development of a positive creationist model of Earth history. Back in 2009, I wrote this book, The New Creationism, and what I tried to, to do in that book is to summarize uh, for non-experts, for, for lay people, some of the uh, research work that creationists have done to try to build the, the creationist model. And what I thought I'd do in the talk this evening is to pick up some of the key themes uh, from that book uh, to try to give you a sense of the emerging creationist model and the research on which it's based. Um, it was a broad ranging book, um, and I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in all of the, the areas that I wrote about in the book. I, I, I had to draw on the published research of others. Um, and also, um, what I want to do in this particular talk is not focus so much on some of the fine details, because obviously there's a lot of creationist research uh, on things like specific rock units or specific groups of organisms. But what I want to focus on is research that has contributed to what you might think of as the big picture, uh, kind of high, the high level uh, overarching creationist model. Um, so, so that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, now, can I change the slides or uh, is somebody able to change this? That's great. Uh, I think we should probably begin, though, by asking the question, what is a scientific model? I think, I think we need to define what we mean. Essentially, a, a scientific model is a unifying conceptual framework that's constructed to explain the patterns that we observe in the natural world. Uh, you can think of a scientific model as a kind of story uh, that tries to make sense of a broad range of data, showing how the various bits of data uh, relate to one another and how they fit together into, into a coherent whole. And scientific models are important because they provide the explanatory frameworks in which scientific research is done. And they also help to guide and steer our research in particular directions by suggesting particular questions, particular avenues for us to explore. And building a scientific model um, can be a bit like solving a crime. Uh, you, you can imagine um, a detective. Uh, going to a crime scene, and at the crime scene, he finds various bits of evidence. It might be a weapon or a speck of blood or a fingerprint. And provided those bits of evidence have been collected carefully, um, they, in effect, provide the, the facts, the, the pieces of data on which he can start to build his case. And like the detective, what, what we need is a, a story that connects all of those bits of evidence together and explains them. And that's really one of the hallmarks of a good scientific model. Uh, it has the ability to explain uh, a wide range of data within a single coherent uh, framework. So a good example might be uh, Newton's theory of gravity, uh, which was able to explain an apple uh, falling from a tree, uh, as well as the motion of the moon around the earth. 
So it can explain a, a wide range of data with a single um, with a single framework. Another hallmark of a, a good scientific model is that it allows us to make predictions, uh, predictions that we can then go out and test by collecting more data or carrying out more experiments. And uh, those tests may sometimes help to confirm our model, or it may be that our model uh, needs to be revised as more data comes in. Uh, of course, we don't automatically throw out a scientific model because some of the data doesn't fit. Um, models can be modified uh, to increase their explanatory uh, power and, and scope, uh, especially when we know that a model is able to explain lots of, lots of other data really well. So uh, models can be quite resilient. They can actually sometimes be quite hard to... Uh, to uh, falsify because they can be that they can be modified to account for more data. Um, so what I want uh, to do then is just look at some of the creationist efforts uh, over recent years to build scientific models, and I'm going to focus on two key disciplines on uh, the fields of biology and geology. Now, in my book, um, I also talked about uh, cosmology and anthropology and other areas as well. But I think for the sake of time, uh, I'll focus on those uh, two disciplines, uh, but just be aware that you know, the scope of this discussion could be opened out into, into other areas. Uh, next slide, please. So firstly then, um, biology. Um, I apologize, by the way, we, we had a slight technical uh, problem with my presentation and and I think some of the formatting on the slides has been slightly messed up so we're actually losing a little bit of the text here but hopefully you can you can see um, the, the sort of key points here so so first then um biology I think one of the things that must inevitably strike anybody um, studying biology is the remarkable diversity of life uh, current estimates suggest that there are almost 9 million species on the earth, uh, not counting uh, microbes. Uh, and of course, that doesn't include all of the uh, species which are now extinct. There are about 250,000 fossil species, most, most of them now extinct. And these species come in a dazzling array of shapes and sizes and designs. And so an obvious question for the biologist is, how did all of this diversity originate? According to uh, evolutionary theory, uh, the history of life can be characterized by continuity. Uh, all living things are said to have arisen from a single common ancestor, uh, which then diversified into all of the species that have ever lived by solely natural processes operating over vast periods of time, over hundreds of millions of years. And we can depict this view as a single evolutionary tree of life. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Now, the Bible, sorry, can we just go back a slide? That's it. The Bible suggests a very different history of life um, to the evolutionary model. Uh, according to Genesis chapter 1, uh, God made all living things in the course of a single week. Uh, they didn't arise by natural processes operating over these vast periods of time. Uh, moreover, um, Genesis chapter 1 tells us that God made different things on different days of the creation week. So plants on day three, birds and sea creatures on day five, uh, land animals and people on day six. And so this suggests that discontinuity uh, is a major feature of life. And so the creationist view has often been depicted not as a single evolutionary tree, but rather as an orchard of trees, where each tree represents a distinctly different group of organisms 
separately created in the beginning by God, but within which um, great variety is is possible. And we we can refer to these created groups as created kinds. Uh, next slide. And it's this idea of created kinds that led the uh, creationist biologist Frank Lewis Marsh to introduce in 1941 the concept of the baromin. Uh, baromin is a word that is rather clumsily derived from the Hebrew, meaning created kind. And according to uh, Marsh, the created kind or the baromin uh, was a broad group, uh, often encompassing many species. Uh, each of these baromins had been created separately, but Marsh believed that a great deal of variation was possible within each of these created groups. So, for example, um, wolves and coyotes and jackals and domestic dogs, regarded by modern biologists as separate species, were considered by Marsh to be members of a single created kind, a single baromin, based on their overall similarity of form and also the fact that many of these species could interbreed and produce hybrid offspring. In fact, Marsh regarded the ability of two organisms to hybridize with one another as important evidence that they belonged to the same created kind, to the same baromin. Next slide. And ever since uh, that time, many other creationists have uh, adopted uh, this hybridization criterion proposed by Marsh as a means to identify the original created kind. So consider, for example, the uh, anatidae. Uh, which is the very diverse uh, group of birds, which includes ducks and geese and swans. Uh, within this group, uh, there are about 148 species, and 126 of them can be connected either directly or indirectly with other species within the group through hybridization. And so many creationists have inferred from this that the whole family, the anatidae, represents a single baromin, a single created kind. Next slide. But there are some limitations uh, to this hybridization approach. For example, uh, it's impossible to know whether two extinct organisms that are known only from fossils would have been able to, to hybridize. Uh, and also, uh, hybridization can't be applied to organisms like bacteria, which reproduce asexually. Uh, in other cases, it's not practical or desirable uh, for organisms to hybridize, for example, when a species is endangered. Uh, another problem is that the failure of two organisms to hybridize isn't definitive. Uh, there are lots of reasons why two species might not be able to cross with one another, uh, even though they are actually members of the same created kind. And of course, sometimes it's even hard to decide when hybridization has been successful. I think most people would regard uh, a sterile cross, um, something like a mule, uh, to be a hybridization success. But what about uh, the production of a fetus that doesn't then survive until birth is is should we regard that as a successful hybridization so there are some limitations to this approach next slide please so recognizing then the limitations of hybridization uh, a broader approach to identifying and classifying the created kinds was proposed by dr kurt wise in 1990 uh, he called this approach baraminology, or the study of the created kinds. And since 1990, it, it's kind of blossomed into a, quite a dynamic field of creation studies in its own right, um, with its own conferences and publications and, and a growing literature. And baraminologists uh, seek to apply 
many different criteria, not not just hybridization, uh, to identify the created kinds by applying all of these criteria to look for similarities, holistic similarities and differences between groups of species. Next slide, please. So baromenology doesn't try to identify um, each created kind in one go. Uh, rather, it works by a process that we might call successive approximation. Uh, larger groups are split up and smaller groups are added to until eventually, hopefully, we've identified all of the members of a particular baramin uh, or, or created kind. So, for example, we might point to evidence suggesting that the carnivores should be split up into several different created kinds, cats, dogs, bears, and so on. Or we might find evidence that a tiger and a lion and a cheetah should all be united together into a single created kind. Next slide. And the goal is basically to converge on what we call the hollow baramin, um, the group that includes all members of the created kind that we're interested in, but no members of any other created kind. And in the last um, decade or, or so, an increasing number of statistical methods have been introduced to help us to detect patterns of continuity and discontinuity between groups of organisms. Uh, there's something called baromenic distance. Uh, we use multidimensional scaling. Um, principal components analysis has been used, various other clustering methods. And our, our toolkit, our baromenology toolkit, has, has grown. And these methods, these various statistical methods, have been applied to a growing number of animal and plant groups. I, I think the last um, tally that I saw published was by uh, Dr. Todd Wood in 2016, where he listed um, 70 uh, identified hollow baramins um, based on studies of over 150 different taxonomic groups. But obviously that was a few years ago now and uh, more work has been published since. The results of all of this work, um, at least in, in broad terms, I think has tended to confirm the idea uh, that species were not separately created, uh, that the created kinds contain multiple species. And in fact, in about two thirds of uh, cases, uh, certainly in, at least in the vertebrates, um, the created kind seems to be roughly equivalent to a biological family, so the dog family, the cat family, the horse family, and so on. Sometimes uh, the the created kind comes out at uh, a bit higher than a family, maybe a super family. Sometimes it's a bit lower than a family, maybe a subfamily, or in rare cases, perhaps a genus. But most often, it, it seems to be roughly equivalent to, to what we describe as a uh, as a biological family in the in the Linnaean sense. Next slide, please. Now, of course, if created uh, multiple species, uh, that raises another uh, intriguing question, which is how did those species originate? Um, and the answer seems to be that God endowed those uh, baromins, those created kinds, with the ability to give rise to many new species and varieties in a process that we call diversification. Um, this ability to adapt can be seen as a, a design to equip the created kinds to survive in a changing world, especially, I think, after the global devastation of Noah's flood. So all of the diversity that we see in organisms today um, within the creation model has come from the survivors of the flood, whether, whether the birds and land animals that were on the ark or the organisms that survived outside the ark. And one very striking implication of this creationist model 
is how quickly this diversification must have taken place because we know from the Bible and from other ancient um, records that many modern species were around within a thousand years or less of the time of the flood, including um, lions, camels, donkeys, and so on. And what that means is that the animals that came off the ark must have diversified very, very quickly. Um, in fact, after the flood, um, there was probably a period of almost explosive uh, biological change, unlike anything that we observe going on today. Next slide, please. So given what we've said so far, what were the mechanisms by which um, these rapid changes took place? Well, one idea is that this uh, rapid diversification was associated with the activity of mobile genetic elements. Uh, mobile genetic elements are bits of DNA that are able to independently replicate themselves and move around within and even between uh, genomes. And today, uh, most biologists would regard these mobile genetic elements as um, predominantly harmful and uh, parasitic. Uh, they behave in a virus-like fashion. Um, but Dr. Todd Wood, um, some years ago, proposed that perhaps they were originally designed by God to cooperate with the genomes of living organisms to generate diversity. And so he referred to this, uh, this idea, this concept, uh, as the aging model. Uh, age stands for altruistic genetic elements, because the idea is that they were originally designed with a beneficial or altruistic function. And uh, other creationists have been developing very similar ideas. Some of you may have read uh, Peter Borger's uh, papers, for example, on what he calls variation-inducing genetic elements. And there are a number of ways in which these, um, these altruistic genetic elements may have helped to generate diversity. For example, uh, we know that some of these mobile elements are able to promote or inhibit the activity of genes or to cause genes to recombine into new arrangements. And obviously that has the potential to generate uh, a lot of biological change very quickly. Now, of course, today, um, most biological change seems to happen more slowly. Uh, and so uh, Todd would propose that it, it may be that um, the accumulation of harmful mutations in these mobile genetic elements gradually led to the reduction or loss of their original uh, beneficial function. Uh, if you want to have a look at his paper, it was published in a, a journal um, called Origins, and it, it's a very interesting read. Uh, he lists a number of biological features and suggests that the age, aging model is able to explain them better than previous evolutionary and creationist models. And he also um, proposes a number of uh, tests. He, he makes some predictions, which uh, you know we, we can go out and test. And there was also a follow-up paper, I think, um, at a subsequent ICC. There's still obviously a great deal that we don't know uh, about um, mechanisms of speciation after the flood. And it's almost certain that as well as mobile genetic elements, there are other things going on. Um, other creationists have looked at the role of directed mutations because it turns out that um, mutations may, at least some mutations may not be completely random. Uh, others have looked at something called continuous environmental tracking. There, there are various ideas um, which you can find in the literature. And so this continues to be a very active area of creationist research. Next slide. Next slide, please. Another area of... Um, 
biology where creationists have been developing models and actually this this is um one that i actually didn't talk about i think in in the new creationism but i think it's it's worth mentioning here concerns the dispersal of organisms after the flood for example explaining how organisms uh, may have managed to cross major geographic barriers like um, oceans back in 2003 um, Kurt Wise and Matthew Croxton proposed a model in which uh, huge mats of floating vegetation uh, perhaps hundreds of square miles in area may have provided a means of transport across ocean barriers for many organisms after the flood uh, the idea is that these huge um, mats of, of floating debris would have resulted from the destruction of the world's forests during the flood and that they would have remained afloat in the oceans perhaps for um, some centuries after the flood. And after the flood, um, animals, plant, uh, herbivores would have been attracted onto beached mats uh, because obviously they were a source of food. And in turn, um, carnivores would have been attracted onto the mats because they were following the herbivores. And uh, as these mats then drifted with the prevailing ocean currents, animals that wandered onto the mats, that found their way onto the mats, could have been transported even hundreds of miles across major ocean barriers. Uh, over time, uh, these maps would have slowly uh, degraded. They would slowly have broken up, and eventually, uh, they would have become. It would have become incapable of carrying most land animals, particularly particularly the larger ones. Next slide, please. And Kurt Wise and Matthew Croxton argued in their 2003 paper that this rafting model is actually able to explain. Uh, an impressive array of data. Uh, for example, regions of the Earth with high endemism, in other words, with many unique species found only in that region, uh, those regions tended to correspond to places where rafts would likely have beached after the flood. Uh, also, um, many organisms show uh, what we might call disjunct distributions or split ranges in which you have closely related species on opposite sides of uh, an ocean barrier but nowhere else and these split ranges can often be matched to the paths of major ocean currents uh, suggesting that rafting across the ocean uh, barrier may have provided the pathway between those widely separated areas. Next slide, please. Now, another, <clears throat> another area of uh, research within creation biology concerns the origin of what we might call natural evils. So we're thinking of things like predators, parasites, and pathogens. Um, if as the Bible, I think, indicates there was no human or animal death before Adam's fall, then it follows that the features of organisms that are responsible for death or harm must have existed in a very different form before the fall. And so uh, creationists are uh, very interested in how these natural evils may have arisen since the time of the fall. And a number of different ideas have been put forward. Um, some of these natural evils may have originated uh, as a result of a simple change in habitat or behavior. Uh, for example, uh, many types of bacteria live in the intestines of humans and animals and provide mutual benefit. But if these bacteria become displaced, getting into a supply of drinking water, for example, uh, then they may cause illnesses such as diarrhea. Uh, other natural evils may be the result of degenerative changes since the fall. 
and uh, genetic diseases such as sickle cell anemia and cystic fibrosis, which are caused by harmful mutations, uh, would fall into this category. Another example might be the Ebola virus. Uh, there are several strains of Ebola. Uh, some of them cause a severe infection that can lead to death, but there are other strains that produce no symptoms at all. And there is some evidence that degenerative changes have led to the, uh, the emergence of virulent strains from closely related non-virulent strains. So, uh, you know, it could be that degener degeneration in the creation has also led to some of these natural evils. Next slide, please. But I think um, the most challenging category of natural evils to explain within the creationist model are the structures that appear to be very beautifully designed in many respects, but designed to harm or to kill. Uh, a good example might be the pit vipers of the New World, which have a uh, pair of heat-sensitive pits, hence the name, uh, and these heat-sensitive pits help to guide the, the snake towards its prey. Uh, the skull is designed so that the fangs fold up like switchblades and extend only when the jaws are opened. The fangs themselves are designed like hypodermic needles. They're hollow, and when the snake strikes, uh, venom from special glands is injected through the hollow fangs into the prey animal. Uh, the venom itself is a complex cocktail of chemicals that causes the victim to die, for example, by internal bleeding. So how did such a system arise uh, in, in the, the creationist uh, perspective? It's certainly hard to think of a benign use uh, for this arrangement, and it's so complex and integrated that it seems unlikely that we can explain it simply by degenerative changes since the fall. Um, one possibility is that some organisms may have originally been endowed with genetic information for structures and behaviors that were not expressed phenotypically until sin came into the world um that seems a you know a quite a radical idea but perhaps there are ways we could test for that maybe there are, there are things that we could do maybe we could search the genomes of organisms to look for evidence of functional genes that have not been switched on or previously active genes that have been switched off um, but there's still a great deal that we don't know. I think there are all sorts of interesting research possibilities uh, when it comes to explaining various types of natural evils within a creationist framework. Well, that kind of brings us, uh, I think, to the end of um, what I wanted to say about biology. But what about geology? Uh, next slide, please. 1961. Um, is widely regarded as a landmark year in creationist geology because that was the year that this book was published, The Genesis Flood, um, by John Whitcomb and Henry Morris. Uh, and it's a book uh, that I think caused many Christian people to begin to think seriously about the implications of the biblical record of the flood for the science of geology. And ever since uh, this book was published, a number of uh, scientific models of the flood have, have been proposed. Uh, the most promising, I think, uh, being the model known as catastrophic plate tectonics, or CPT for short. Uh, CPT uh, was first uh, presented by a team of creationist earth scientists at the International Conference on Creationism in 1994. And essentially, um, CPT is a modification of the conventional theory of plate tectonics. 
So to understand it, we we just need to briefly familiarize ourselves uh, with some of that theory's basic elements. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, we can begin with the internal structure of the Earth. Now, although, although we're not able to study the Earth's interior directly, um, we can draw some inferences about it based on the passage of earthquake waves as they travel through the Earth. And what these studies suggest is that the Earth has a layered structure uh, comprising a core and a mantle and a crust. The core uh, is essentially metallic. Uh, it has a, a liquid outer layer and a solid inner portion. And then uh, around the core, there is this thick um, rocky layer called the mantle, and it is rock. Um, it's solid, but it's able to um, flow in a plastic fashion uh, under certain conditions of stress. And then uh, we have this thin layer that we call the crust, uh, the thin outer layer, and the crust is divided into um, two types. There's oceanic crust, which is made of uh, dense rock, which sits lower in the Earth's mantle, and so it forms the ocean basins. And then we have the continental crust, which is composed of uh, lighter rock, less dense rock, and that floats higher in the mantle. And it's also thicker, uh, tends to be thicker than the oceanic crust, and it forms the world's uh, land masses. Next slide, please. And the, the crust of the Earth is um, broken into a series of rigid plates. Actually, we, we call them lithospheric plates. So they actually, it's, it's the crust plus a piece of the uppermost mantle as well. Um, and these rigid tectonic plates are able to move um, relative to one another. Uh, they can move apart from one another, uh, or they move towards one another, or they just slip past uh, one another, as you can see in the illustration here. Uh, where plates are moving apart, uh, we call these spreading ridges uh, or mid-ocean ridges, and new ocean crust is formed along those uh, spreading ridges where plates are separating and where plates uh, move towards one another um, sometimes uh, one plate will dive below another plate and uh, in effect you, you have old ocean crust being sort of recycled into the earth's interior along uh, subduction zones uh, and as these ocean plates move around um, any you know continents which are attached to these plates are, are pulled along with them. Next slide, please. So the CPT model um, begins with the surface of the pre-flood Earth uh, looking something like uh, what you see here in in this slide, uh, divided into oceanic and continental crust, just as it is today. Uh, I think that's a reasonable assumption uh, given that. Genesis 1 tells us that God, you know, created seas and dry land. But in the CPT model, um, the original ocean crust was cooler than today's ocean crust and therefore uh, denser. And it was sitting on top of uh, warm mantle rock, which has a similar composition to the ocean crust, uh, but is much warmer. And so in these circumstances, the cold, dense ocean crust would have had a natural tendency to sink, to sink into the underlying mantle. And given these circumstances, it probably wouldn't have taken very much to set the tectonic plates into motion. And so the CPT model proposes that um, the flood began when the cold oceanic crust of the pre-flood world began to catastrophically break away from the margins of the pre-flood continents and plunge into the Earth's mantle. Next slide, please. And <clears throat> numerical modeling by one of the CPT researchers, Dr. John Baumgardner, 
has shown that these cold ocean plates uh, could have been pulled into the Earth's interior much faster than uh, the present plates. And the way that this would work would, would be a kind of process of thermal runaway. Uh, imagine one of these ocean plates diving into the mantle. As it uh, began to plunge into the mantle, it would have deformed the surrounding mantle rocks, causing frictional heating. Uh, that frictional heating would have resulted in a decrease in the viscosity of the uh, mantle rocks around the plate, allowing the slab of ocean crust to dive even faster. And in turn, that would have caused more frictional heating, further weakening of the mantle rocks and so on. And so we, we have this process, a, a kind of positive feedback process that would have resulted um, in plates sinking through the mantle at rates of meters per second. And these numerical um, simulations that Baumgartner has done have, have been confirmed experimentally in the laboratory in that you can take silicate materials and under certain conditions of, uh, of stress, those materials uh, can weaken by 10 or more orders of magnitude uh, without ever reaching their melting point. Uh, so, you know, the mantle rocks really have this ability to, to dramatically weaken and allow the plates to, to pass through the mantle very, very fast. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, at the same time as the plates are rapidly separating at the mid-ocean ridges, sorry, as the plates are diving into the Earth's mantle, you've got this new, you've got the plates separating at the mid-ocean ridges, a new hot material welling up to form new ocean floor. You have a rapid drop in pressure, partial melting of the underlying mantle, and so you form this new ocean floor at the spreading ridges. And as those uh, hot magmas come into contact with the cold ocean water, the water would have flashed to steam and been propelled high into the atmosphere, uh, resulting in supersonic um, steam jets along tens of thousands of miles of um, mid-ocean ridge. And the CPT model suggests that this is what the Bible is referring to when it speaks about the fountains of the great deep breaking open in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11. And, of course, the seawater that was caught up in these, um, these incredible steam jets would have fallen, much of it at least, would have fallen back to the earth as an intense global rain, perhaps explaining also the biblical reference to the op opening of the windows of heaven. And because this newly generated ocean crust is uh, was warmer and more thermally buoyant, more thermally expanded than the old ocean crust it was replacing, the level of the ocean floor um, would have risen significantly, causing the ocean basins effectively to become shallower and displacing ocean water onto the continents, causing a rise in sea level so that the continents are inundated with ocean water. But when the old ocean crust was completely recycled um, into the mantle, effectively this process would have started to come to an end because the new ocean crust was warmer and less dense than the old ocean floor. Uh, and so it had less of a tendency to plunge into the mantle. Uh, and so subduction would have slowed down Fountains of the Great Deep would have begun to be closed. The global rain would have ceased. And then over time, as that new ocean floor uh, began to cool and subside, the floodwaters would have drained off the continents and back into the ocean basins, which were deepening. So in short, this is the catastrophic plate tectonics model. Next slide, please. And when we think about um, conventional plate tectonics, I think we need to recognize that it that it is a very successful theory. It, it, it explains, it enables geologists to explain a wide range of features uh, of the geology of the Earth to make many useful predictions. 
Uh, plate tectonics helps us to explain why the present day continents seem to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. It helps us to explain why geological features like mountain belts and um, fossil distributions match on opposite sides of, of ocean barriers. It helps us to explain the distribution of volcanoes and earthquakes and ocean trenches and lots of other things. But what I find really exciting about CPT, the catastrophic plate tectonics model, is that it seems to be able to explain essentially the same data that conventional plate tectonics can explain. But it also seems to explain a number of other things which conventional plate tectonics does not explain, or at least doesn't explain uh, well. Let me give you one example. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's think about the depth and temperature of those subducted slabs that have plunged into the Earth's interior. In conventional plate tectonics, the ocean plates are thought to sink very slowly through the Earth's interior. But what this means is that um, in the conventional model, it was, it was long thought that these plates would get stuck in the uppermost part of the mantle, that there was a kind of barrier through which these, these plates couldn't sink. Uh, whereas in the uh, catastrophic plate tectonics model, John Baumgardner's modeling suggested that under runaway conditions, these sinking slabs would have been able to descend all the way through the Earth's interior, right to the top of the, the core, right the way through the mantle. And significantly, um, since the early 1990s, seismic tomography studies that allow us to use earthquake waves to, to look inside the interior of the Earth have revealed these cool slabs of material, um, apparently slabs of old ocean crust. They're located beneath subduction zones and they appear to extend all the way down to the bottom, uh, to, to, to the, bo the top of the core, to the bottom of the mantle. Um, so this seems to be a, a very striking confirmation of a prediction that arose from the creationist model. And what's more, these subducted slabs seem to be cooler than the surrounding mantle rock. And yet on conventional timescales, uh, it would be expected that they would have reached thermal equilibrium with the warm surrounding mantle rocks. Uh, and, and the fact that they're, they're still apparently so much cooler than the surrounding mantle suggests that um, they can't have been plunging into the mantle for tens of millions of years. So although um, there's still a, a lot of detail to work out to, to apply the catastrophic plate tectonics model, and there are still lots of unanswered questions, I, I do think CPT provides a very promising model for being able to explain a, a very wide range of geological features uh, that we see in the present day earth next slide please now creationists have also been um, developing models of the post-flood period uh, the time when the earth was recovering from uh, this global catastrophe and one implication of uh, CPT is that during the flood, an enormous amount of heat would have been absorbed by the oceans, so that after the flood, the oceans would have been much warmer than they were before the flood. And the warmth of the post flood oceans um, would have resulted in uh, huge amounts of evaporation from, uh, from the surface of the oceans, uh, seawater being evaporated, so, it, so it, it's kind of pumped into the atmosphere. And as this warm, moisture-laden air circulated over the continents, um, it would have resulted in very, very high rates of precipitation. And as the world cooled down after the flood, much of that precipitation, uh, certainly over the mid to high latitudes, uh, would have fallen as snow. And in the creationist model, the snow actually would have fallen so quickly and in such quantities that the warmth of the summer wouldn't have been sufficient to melt all of the snow that had fallen the previous winter. 
And so the snow uh, would eventually build up and become compacted into extensive ice sheets. And those ice sheets, as they accumulated, um, eventually the ice would have flowed under its own weight and surged out across areas that previously had been free of ice. Next slide, please. Uh, and creationists have been doing some num numerical modeling of um, post-flood climates based on, uh, you know, warm post-flood oceans. A uh, lot, of, lot of work, initial work was done by Dr. Larry Vardaman at the Institute for Creation Research. And uh, Dr. Steve Golmer is now sort of taking up much of uh, that research. And what this um, work has shown is ice in the post-flood period, ice building up across the mid to high latitudes within uh, a timescale of a few centuries. In fact, uh, Dr. Kurt Weiser suggested that given how quickly the ice sheets grow and then melt in the creationist model, we probably shouldn't refer to it as the ice age. We should refer to it rather as the ice advance. And this ice advance um, model um, has some advantages. It's the only model, I think, that is consistently able to explain the accumulation of ice where we know from geological evidence ice actually existed. Um, it's rather different from the conventional Ice Age model in that it suggests that there was only one episode of glaciation with multiple surges of the ice sheet rather than multiple ice ages over the last you know, 2.7 million years or so. Um, but this may actually help us to explain, for example, how some areas on the continents remained ice free while apparently being surrounded by ice and glaciated um, multiple times. Also, the ice advance model predicts uh, thinner ice sheets than the conventional model. And in recent years, there, there's been, I think, a growing trend to revise downwards the thickness of the ice sheet, both in North America and in Europe. For example, in, in the English Lake District, um, there are um, trim lines around the flanks of the mountains. Uh, these are erosional features which indicate that the ice there um, only reached about 800 to 870 metres thick, uh, which is much less than the 1,600 metres that previous theoretical models had suggested. So I think there are some interesting predictions that come from this model that uh, you know we can, we can go out and we can test. Next slide, please. Uh, while we're thinking about geology, sh we should probably just very briefly talk about creationist research on the fossil record. Um, in this slide, you can see here two models for understanding um, the fossil record. The conventional evolutionary model is on the right, and then there's a creationist interpretation on the left. Uh, creationists typically suggest that... Um, the fossil record can be divided up into three parts, a part that was formed before the flood, a part that was formed during the flood, and then a part that was formed after the flood. And although there's still a great deal of uh, debate among creationists about which parts of the fossil record correspond to, you know, which parts of biblical history, I think most would agree that the Paleozoic and Mesozoic sediments were deposited by the flood. Not everybody agrees with that view, but that seems to be a, a fairly broad consensus. And if that's correct, then the fossils in those sediments must obviously represent communities of organisms that were overwhelmed and buried during the flood. Next slide, please. Uh, back in 1946, uh, creationist Harold Clark um, proposed a model for understanding the fossil record in terms of the flood. Uh, he proposed that as the flood waters advanced from the oceans onto the land, communities of organisms would have been buried in the order that they were encountered by the rising flood waters. And so he proposed that the 
sequence of fossils in the fossil record reflected the ecological distribution of organisms before the flood rather than the ages. And uh, this view came to be known as the ecological zonation model. Uh, and it suggests that we can use the fossil record, we can kind of work back from the fossil record to try to understand what the world was like before the flood, that we can use fossil communities preserved in flood rocks to reconstruct pre-flood ecosystems. Um, now, Clark's model, as you can see in the slide here, um, proposed that these ecosystems were essentially a series of ecological zones that varied in altitude. Uh, they were altitudinal um, zones from going from the deep ocean up into the mountains. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, uh, you, you can see uh, that this model has actually been um, revised um, considerably. Uh, so I think uh, today we think more in terms of a series of biogeographic provinces or biomes that were distributed um, laterally on the surface of the earth, maybe even on different continents, rather than a series of ecological zones at different elevations. And uh, these ecosystems would not have been buried in place, rather the fossil the organisms living in these ecosystems would have been picked up, transported and um, buried by the floodwaters to produce the, the vertical sequence of rock layers that we see today. And some of the pre-flood biomes that we, we've begun to reconstruct from the fossil record seem to be very, very different from any ecosystems that exist on the surface of the earth today. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so Dr. Kurt Wise um, uh, published a couple of papers uh, in 2003. Uh, the first one uh, was looking at the series of fossils that we find um, buried in the uppermost Precambrian sediments. Uh, and he reconstructed these as a, a community of organisms living in a very extensive hydrothermal reef, a kind of stromatolite reef biome. Stromatolites are these microbial mounds. And uh, he, he thought that they must have formed some kind of huge barrier reef around the margins of the pre-flood continents, behind which there was a deep water lagoon in which there were other animals or other creatures living, um, including the uh, Ediacaran, fauna that we find in uh, the uppermost Precambrian. And uh, if you want to read more details about, um, you know, the evidence on which he kind of bases this reconstruction, uh, you can look up his 2003 paper. And then if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see another um, biome, the floating forest biome, uh, where Kurt um, reconstructed the plants and the animals of the mid to upper Paleozoic as the remains of a vast floating forest that existed before the flood, uh, somewhat like a quaking bog where vegetation grows out over the surface of a lake or a bog. But this would have been on an altogether bigger scale. Uh, this, this, he, he's reconstructed this as a huge continent-sized um, mat of floating vegetation that was growing out over the deep um, pre-flood ocean. Around the margins of that forest, you would have had small, very water-dependent plants. And then towards the center, the map would have been thick enough to support shrubs and full-grown trees and so on. And uh, during the flood, he proposes that this floating forest was broken up, that it was um, essentially buried from the outside in, with the central part buried to form the um, extensive Paleozoic coal seams. And again, if you want to sort of read the details, you can, you can look up his paper. And of course, today, you know, many of the inhabitants of these pre-flood communities uh, are now extinct. Uh, sometimes we have relic populations, a few survivors, 
and so I think our modern day environments seem to be greatly impoverished in terms of their diversity, diversity of organisms and also diversity of communities and biomes than the world before the flood. Next slide, please. Now, I think given time, we'll try to sort of skip over this fairly fairly quickly, but I did also just want to briefly mention uh, the work of the rate group. Um, one major aspect of geology, of course, is radiometric dating methods, which use naturally occurring radioactive isotopes as a kind of clock to assign ages to the Earth's rocks and minerals. And uh, many of you may know that there was this major project that ran between 1997 and 2005 where a team of creationists came together to investigate um, radiometric dating they published um, a couple of technical volumes and then this popular book thousands not billions uh, next slide please so what did the uh, rate group um find uh, it, in the course of their research well firstly uh, they concluded that very large amounts of radioactive decay equivalent to millions of years worth of nuclear decay at present day rates had indeed occurred in the earth's past so it seems that there has been a lot of nuclear decay but they also pointed to a number of pieces of evidence that seem to indicate that there have been episodes of accelerated nuclear decay in the earth's past um, they particularly assigned episodes of rapid decay to the creation week and to the flood. Uh, and uh, we, we don't have time to go through all of the pieces of evidence, but they found systematic discordances, disagreements between um, dating methods um, applied to the same samples. So it wasn't simply that dates disagreed from different methods. But rather, there was a systematic pattern to the to the disagreement, which um, could be interpreted in terms of acceleration of decay rates. Uh, there was a high amount. There were high amounts of helium uh, trapped in crustal rocks. Helium is a byproduct of alpha decay, um, but measurements of helium diffusion from the rocks suggested that the helium should have leaked away within only a few thousand years and so this suggests lots of decay but within a short time frame and they also pointed to uh, short-lived polonium radio halos parentless polonium radio halos in certain types of rock uh, which again indicated large amounts of decay but in, in short time frames so they proposed this idea quite a radical idea of accelerated radioactive decay um, and uh, if they're right about that, then uh, and, and radioactive decay rates were higher in the past, then obviously radiometric dating methods would be overestimating the true age of um, the Earth's rocks and minerals. There's been a lot of discussion about the findings of the rate group, lots of debate, um, various criticisms have been published, further work is, you know, is continues to go on um, and uh, I, again you can read more about that in the book we probably don't have time to go into too many more details here but I just wanted to mention work being done on dating methods next slide please so as we start to sort of draw this to a, to a close and hopefully have have time for a few questions um, I, I just wanted to try and summarize the overall creationist model that seems to be emerging from from all of this research at least in the fields of biology and geology so in creation biology um, we have this idea that there were created kinds that probably approximate biological families uh, these kinds seem to have rapidly diversified after the flood probably involving several mechanisms but maybe including the activity of mobile genetic elements uh, dispersal of organisms after the flood appears to have been rapid uh, with rafting on giant mats of vegetation debris probably playing a major role at least in the uh, early post-flood period and we have uh, the development of natural evils uh, by a number of mechanisms displacement 
degeneration, but probably also involving aspects of design. And then next slide, please. And then in, in geology, uh, creation geology proposes that the flood was the result of the catastrophic rearrangement of the Earth's tectonic plates driven by um, thermal runaway in the Earth's mantle. Uh, much of the fossil record, uh, we think, represents the sequential burial of pre-flood ecological communities dur during the catastrophe. After the flood, uh, the world was warm and wet, but cooled down and dried out, culminating eventually in the uh, rapid growth of ice sheets across the mid to high latitudes. And we think uh, that radioactive decay rates were accelerated by orders of magnitude during the flood and so overestimate the age of rocks and minerals. Next slide, please. Uh, a number of possible directions for future research. This is a model um, that I've described here that is a work in progress. Uh, there's a need in creation biology to apply uh, barominology methods to more groups. We need to continue to validate our existing statistical methods and to introduce new ones to help us. Uh, we need more work on mechanisms of speciation and dispersal. Uh, for example, trying to explain how uh, unique islands on uh, a continent like Australia came to be there. Uh, there's also a need, I think, to develop a theory of design in its broadest form uh, to explain, for example, patterns of similarity above the level of the Barramin. So th those are just a few areas where I think you know, there's, there's a need for more work. In creation geology, one of the big outstanding problems, I think, is what we often refer to as the flood heat problem. Uh, how do we uh, account for the dissipation of all of the heat that was generated by the geological activity of the flood, um, not only from accelerated decay, but also from catastrophic plate tectonics and possibly some other sources as well? Um, the numerical uh, modeling of plate motions. Uh, John Baumgardner's work really began with a configuration that resembles Pangaea, but we know uh, that, or at least we think we know that there was a, an earlier episode of plate motion uh, in the Paleozoic prior to the assembly of Pangaea. Um, how do we account for that? Um, what about plate motions in the post-flood world? Uh, so that there's more work to be done there. A great deal of work remains to be done in the area of the fossil record and trying to account for fossil order. I think we've made a good start, um, but there's a lot more to do. So my final slide, you'll be relieved to know. Uh, I want to close my talk um, really by just saying, suggesting that as creationists, I think we should be encouraged uh, by all of this. Um, it is certainly true that there's a lot that we don't know. And for every question our research has answered, um, there are a host of new questions that we hadn't even thought about. Um, we certainly haven't solved all the problems. There are some very big challenges um, still to face. And I'm absolutely sure that some of the models that I've described here will need to be modified in significant ways or perhaps even um, they may turn out to be wrong and, and we have to replace them altogether. But um, bearing in mind, I think, how few creationist researchers there really are, uh, how few resources that we have available to us as scientists and how recently uh, most of this work has been done, I think the results so far are very exciting. There are some real success stories here. There are creationist models that have shown some genuine explanatory and predictive power. So I think we have uh, good reasons to be encouraged by all of this. And I'm convinced that model building, constructing creationist models, is where we should be focusing our efforts in the future, because I think that focuses our minds on uh, doing good science. It's already, I think, as I've 
tried to show helping us to answer some really important questions. But it is a huge project, uh, and it's one that we have really only begun. We, we've only started. We've, we've only begun to scratch the surface. And so I would say if you're a student or if you're a scientist or a scholar in some other discipline, there is definitely room for you to um, be involved and to, to make a contribution. Uh, and I, th I think the prospects for creationist research in the future look very exciting. Well, thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. And uh, perhaps we can go over to some questions if there are any. Yes, um, we did receive some questions. Um, the questions come from uh, Willen Jan Blom. They're quite into detail. Uh, so they're asking specific about, I'll read it for you. Um, why did parts of those floating forests, so that you've been talking about, with stigmaria trees and large insects invariably end up in the Carboniferous and never, for example, in the Mesoic layers. Maybe you can even explain the question a little bit for all the other listeners. So it's, a, I think it's about yeah. mixing uh, up the. Uh, yeah. So, so I think um, what we're seeing is a particular episode during the flood when this floating forest which, as I understand it, uh, Kurt Wise reconstructs as uh, something that was essentially over the deep ocean in the pre-flood world. At some point during the flood, that floating forest um, floats over, it's disrupted, and it floats over the submerged continents. And it, the flood waters essentially rip it apart from the outside in. So... The plants that are around the margins, which are these small, very water-dependent plants, they don't have true roots, um, uh, they are buried first. So we, we first see these plants showing up, I think, in the Silurian. And eventually, you know, as the flood sort of rips this thing apart from the outside in, plants that are located further towards the interior of the floating mat, get buried and so we have a succession of plants that are being buried in that order by the time we get to the carboniferous it's the central part of the floating forest that's being destroyed and in that central part of the floating forest we have these very large trees uh, they appear to be uh, hollow from looking at the anatomy of these trees they appear to be trees that were designed to be lightweight and to float effectively on on this a mat and those are the trees that then are being um uh buried to form the carboniferous coal layers so by the time we get beyond the carboniferous um in effect that floating forest ecosystem has been destroyed it's been, it's it's already been ripped apart and buried uh and that's why we're not then seeing those plants in the mesozoic i, th I think in the mesozoic the flood is progressing on to probably terrestrial ecosystems uh, and uh, the plants that are buried in the Mesozoic are rather different types of plants. Um, they were growing in terrestrial ecosystems, not in this aquatic floating forest ecosystem. Yeah. I think this is also what you're describing in your book, right? I remember this. Uh, yes. So here you have a quick view where you show this. So it's also interesting you you want to know more about it you can also uh, check it out in the book um but how to follow up on that that question and answer um is it true that we never find these things mixed up because that is uh something you could expect from uh such a tragic global event that you know at some places um these pieces are mixed up why is it so much um you know that that it seemed to be like there's a development from like yeah. simple species to do uh, to more complicated species and why is it, why are certain species never found up uh mixed up in the same or in different layers 
I I, th I think, uh, and I kind of hinted at this at the end of my talk there, that we, we've done some interesting work where we're able to explain, I think, some first order patterns in the fossil record in terms of this kind of biome model. But I think what we haven't yet gone on to do is to look at second and third order patterns, so the finer scale resolution in, in biostratigraphy. And I don't think we have a fully worked out model to explain all of the problems of biostratigraphy. And it is, it is a complex problem. I, you know, I, I, I did a video, um, I th it's available on the Biblical Creation Trust um, YouTube channel, where I talked about the hardest problems in creationist geology. And I, I specifically talked about some of the problems of, of biostratigraphy. And I, th I come back um, again to one of the things that I, I think I said earlier to you, it might have been in the previous live stream, um, where I said, when we're dealing with the fossil record, when we're dealing with paleontology, um, we're dealing with a discipline that, that's at the interface of two other disciplines, geology and biology. And I think a lot of the problems that we have in creationist paleontology are only going to be resolved when we make further advances in those other disciplines. So to explain biostratigraphy more fully, I think we need a, a better understanding of what pre-flood biogeography was like and how organisms were ecologically zoned, where they were distributed, where these biomes were in the pre-flood world. I think we need a much better understanding of sedimentary transport processes during the flood. Um, were sedimentary transport processes dominated mm -hmm. by turbulent flow, which does tend to mix everything up, or were they dominated perhaps by processes involving laminar flow, which actually can transport organisms often without much abrasion and keeping them separate, um, in you know, discrete from one another. So I think there are all kinds of very complex questions here so i think it's we don't have a fully worked out model but i think it's early days and i think there's a lot more work to do to understand exactly how, how the fossil order came about yeah i think that also became very clear from uh the rest of your lecture uh that really more work needs to be done so i think it's an encouragement for every student or everyone working in the science uh listening uh, to this live stream uh, is really an encouragement if you have to choose uh, your study um, that maybe it's it's uh, something for you. Maybe it's a calling to uh, go and study biology or geology or paleontology or uh, something like that to um, actually help advance creationistic research. Yeah, that's right. And just one thing just to add to that just very briefly is – I think sometimes when we when we think about these um, problems, and th there are problems and challenges and things that we need to to solve, it, it's easy to think that all the problems are all on our side, and actually that's not true at all, because there are all kinds of problems about interpreting the fossil sequence yes. in the evolutionary model. Um, for example, you know, Kurt Wise did a study um, some years ago where he constructed um, phylogenetic trees, you know, evolutionary trees for um, higher taxonomic groups. And from those evolutionary trees, from the order of branching, you can predict the order in which these groups would have evolved in evolutionary history. And then you can go out and you can say, well, does that match the order in which these groups appear in the fossil record? And he actually found that in 95% of cases, there was no agreement between the predicted evolutionary order and the order that we see in the fossil record. So whatever the fossil record is telling us, um, we have problems in interpreting it, whether we hold to an evolutionary model or a creationist model. Yeah, I, I think that's actually in every part of science. Like I um, I did not study natural science, so I'm learning a lot the last years. Uh, I studied social science, but even in, in that, like 
there are so many different theories and they change uh, every now and then and um, there's there's problems and not everyone will admit it but you know we see with the coronavirus like there's scientific papers from both sides we see it in so many things so um, the fact that creationists have um, problems or have to change theories doesn't make it like false science no that's that's just the nature of science <laughs> yeah so that's very good to realize um uh let me see which question i will pick for the last questions yeah so um so what do you think um okay let me ask this one what are some of the argumentations that creationists should not use i mean maybe <laughs> some that you know were used in the past yeah uh, or are very popular but are actually just not true oh uh yeah well let me th a couple of examples very briefly um one i would say is the water vapor canopy theory uh there was this very popular idea it was popular in a lot of the earlier creationist literature uh the idea that um there was a kind of envelope of water vapor around the earth that when God separated the waters from the waters in Genesis one, that this was, this was a vapor canopy and that this um, created a nice even temperature on the earth and uh, had all kinds of other beneficial effects. And that at the time of the flood, the vapor canopy collapsed to form the, to give the 40 days and nights of rain during the flood. Uh, and so this, this was a very popular idea. It was, it was found in lots of creationist books. Uh, I think most creationists, at least those at the kind of research, you know, side, have moved away from that model today, um, partly for on biblical grounds, um, because in, in actual fact, I think the biblical support for it is not as good as perhaps some people imagine. Um, and, and also for various scientific reasons, including the fact that if you if you actually have a vapor canopy with enough water to give you 40 days and nights of rain, um, it, it's too effective in terms of heating the earth. Uh, the greenhouse effect is, is so, uh, is so strong that you actually sort of bake everything alive. Um, so, so I think most researchers have moved away from that. And actually lots of the data that the, the vapor canopy model was used to explain can be explained in other ways. So that's that's one model uh, that I think creationists have, have tended to, to abandon. Uh, and another one, another popular argument, and you still see it sometimes, you know, if you're on social media, uh, it's the idea that uh, there were dinosaur and human footprints together in the um, riverbed in Paluxy in Texas. And uh, again, you know, this is, this is quite a famous argument. Um, shows that humans and dinosaurs coexisted um i think most creationists in certainly in the sort of major creationist organizations recognize that um that there are no human footprints in the Pluxy riverbed i think they're a combination of um, misidentified dinosaur tracks uh which are poorly preserved uh, some tracks were carved during the Great Depression in America, some people made money by carving human tracks and selling them. Um, and, you know, there are various other things, I think, that have been mistaken as human tracks. So so th those are a couple of arguments that I, I would, you know, advise that we don't use any longer. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to have these in mind. And there, there are many others. Um, and, I, yeah, I recognize it, especially for me with my character, um, I always, you know, you sometimes you want something to be true so much, and so you are you tend to believe something uh, so easily. Um, but it's really important that we first of all believe in the Bible, and that is our basis for truth. But that doesn't mean that because we believe in the Bible and we're Christians, we know how everything works. Like that's actually very very arrogant to think, you know, oh these people they're stupid and they believe in evolution. But hey, look, we have the Bible, so 
uh, super simple, you know, look, um, yeah, maybe like the footprints, you know, proof of the Bible. Um, yeah. We have to be diligent in our work. We have to, um, like, first of all, say, yeah, I believe that dinosaurs and humans live together because it's in the Bible. And maybe there is evidence and do like good research on that. I think that's yeah. really important. I also, I think organization for your organization to to really um, be fair. And yeah, I I think you're absolutely right. I I think people sometimes want simple answers. You know, a kind of a magic bullet that's going to be the one thing that disproves evolution. And science is much more complex than that. So. Um, we we need to be careful about that, and also willing to hold on to these scientific models lightly, so that you know we 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 may get them wrong. You know, we 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 may not have everything right, and if if a better model comes along or new data comes along, we need to be prepared to um, to change our our ideas. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that's a good closure for tonight. Um, and it's really telling us that in the end, our ultimate hope and foundation is in Jesus Christ and in the Bible. Um, but that it is really cool to uh, look around and to study and to do science. Uh, and there are answers around there. Um, so we really want to thank you, Paul Garner, for being with us tonight. And um, we, we uh, wish you all the best in the work you're doing for Biblical Creation Trust. Um, and again, thank you for um writing the book and uh, giving permission that to um uh to translate the book into dutch um and uh well thank you god bless you and i will now turn to dutch for the rest of the announcements thank you erica you thank you very much you're welcome uh thank you um yeah dus ik moet nu even overschakelen naar het nederlands um ja, bedankt voor het kijken ook. Uh, we hopen echt dat u het heeft kunnen volgen. Uh, het Engels is misschien soms moeilijk. Maar um, ja, we zijn heel dankbaar dat we van de kennis ook van Paul Garner gebruik mochten maken. En um, ja, nogmaals, we hopen dat u het uh, goed heeft kunnen volgen. Uh, we willen u als kijker natuurlijk wijzen op diverse artikelen die in de livestream zijn voorop bijgekomen. Sommige zijn wellicht ook in de chat genoemd. Maar u kunt ook een kijkje nemen op www.logos.nl. Er zijn ontzettend veel artikelen over deze onderwerpen, ook over andere onderwerpen. Uh, alles rondom apologetiek, bijbel en wetenschap. U kunt ons als volgen op onze social media kanalen. Denk aan Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. En af en toe plaatsen we daar ook wat samenvattingjes voor artikelen. Um, ja, omdat soms artikelen moeilijk te volgen zijn of je even snel uh, wat wil lezen. En dus dat is ook van harte aanbevolen. Um, ja, en normaal gesproken, als we zo'n avond fysiek zouden doen, dan ga je met de collecte zak langs. Um, maar ja, dat kan vanavond niet, want we zien elkaar online. Dus we willen er ook op wijzen dat uh, ook zo'n livestream uh, uiteraard geld kost. En ja, we willen u vragen of u dat uh, een mogelijkheid heeft om te ondersteunen, zodat we ook ons werk kunnen blijven doen, zodat we livestreams kunnen blijven organiseren. En uh, ja, we zijn heel dankbaar voor de mogelijkheden die we hebben. Ook voor volgend jaar. De eerste livestreams zijn al uh, gepland. Dus ook mooi als u uh, daar uw bijdrage kunt leveren. U kunt de QR-code in het beeld scannen. Of ga naar www.logos.nl slash doneer. En er staat vast ook een link ergens in de chat. Um, ook is het handig als u zich abonneert op het YouTube kanaal. Zodat u een melding krijgt als er een, weer een livestream aankomt. Of als we een nieuwe video hebben geplaatst. En ja, misschien is dan nog als uw agenda er even bij pakt voor de volgende geplande livestreams. De eerste twee livestreams van 2023 zijn gepland. En als u een suggestie heeft voor een onderwerp, dan kunt u dat ook mailen naar info.logos.nl of even een chatje sturen in een van de sociale media kanalen. Op 11 januari, dus woensdag 11 januari, staat een livestream met bioloog Dr. Todd Wood. Dat is een bekende, maar ook Engels sprekende. Uh, bioloog. En hij hoopt dan te spreken over wat fossielen zeggen over Adam en Eva. Dus over wat fossielen zeggen over Adam en Eva. Op 8 februari, ook op woensdagavond, hebben we Dr. Matthew McClay bereid te vonden om te praten over de relaties tussen vogels en dinosaurussen. 
Matthew McLean is uh, daar echt op gespecialiseerd. Dus hij kan heel erg vanuit zijn uh, kennisachtergrond daar ook over praten. En um, ja, dat is echt ook een hele mooie gelegenheid. En ja, we hopen u ook dan te zien. Ook dan is er weer heel veel ruimte voor vragen en om met elkaar in gesprek te gaan. Nou, tot zover onze mededelingen. Nogmaals bedankt voor uh, uw aanwezigheid. En we wensen u, het is nog een beetje vroeg, maar we wensen u alvast uh, gezegende kerstdag en een goede nieuw jaar, ja, goed nieuwjaar, jaarwisseling toe. En we hopen u uh, volgend jaar weer te zien in een, uh, ja, in een livestream of op een andere manier. En nogmaals, uh, eerder op de avond, kwart over zeven, was er een boekpresentatie van het boek wat we vorige week uh, hebben uit kunnen geven over de verloren wereld. Dat is ook geschreven door Paul Garner. En u kunt die livestream kunt u ook nog terugkijken. Op ons uh, YouTube kanaal. Op ons Facebook kanaal. En natuurlijk ook van harte aanbevolen om uh, het boek of via uw uh, lokale boekhandel of via webshop.logos.nl te bestellen. Het is echt een aanrader. Heel geschikt voor uh, families, voor in het onderwijs, voor in um, ja, misschien een jeugdvereniging. En um, ja, heel toegankelijk, maar ook uh, wetenschappelijk uh, betrouwbaar. Dus dat ook van harte aanbevolen. Nou, dan uh, wens ik jullie uh, een hele fijne avond en tot ziens.